Yes. Okay. Um, the, the other thing that means is I'm, I'm not able to see the chat while I'm talking. So if there's some question in the chat, uh, I let you know. Yeah, thanks. No, I let you know. Uh, you ready to start? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the third or fourth day of this week. And we continue with Mike's uh, lecture on non commutative function theory. Mike, please. All right. Uh, thanks, Javad. Um, okay, so uh, this is the last of, of the three lectures. Um, uh, in, in this one, I think I, I, I won't try to sort of derive anything or, or prove much of anything. I'm just going to sort of uh, uh, tell you some things that, that, that are true. Um, I, I do want to uh, pick up one uh, end from the, the end of the talk uh, uh, yesterday. So, uh, Yesterday we had looked at, uh, so I introduced this space of uh, uh, square summable uh, NC power series. Uh, this is sort of a Hilbert space in the natural way, just with the L2 inner product on coefficients. Um, and it's sort of uh, obviously some kind of analog of the Hardy space, because if you just took and did this in one variable, you get the Hardy space. Uh, you know, uh, in one variable, uh, functions of square summable power series converge in the disk. Uh, so we showed that uh, these series will converge well in the row ball and the column ball and the spectral radius ball that we introduced. Um, so in particular, what we found from estimating the series was that uh, we have, uh, like, like in, in the classical setting, bounded point evaluation. So these Fs are NC functions on, uh, say, the row ball. And so uh, our estimates on the power series showed that I get these continuous maps from the Hilbert space into n by n matrices by just evaluating at some level. And uh, if we then uh, hit that FW with a, a bilinear form, uh, we get a scalar and then we get bounded point evaluations. So by the Reese theorem, we got these uh, kernel functions. So we have uh, uh, in the ball marx minnikoff language, a CPNC kernel, because there's a natural sort of positivity these conditions obey. Um, and uh, so what I also showed you that, that if you restrict these kernels to the ball at to, to the row ball at level one, which is just the Euclidean ball in CD, we get the Drury Arvison kernel. I'm going to talk uh, more about that connection uh, later uh, in, in this lecture. Uh, but I do want to make a couple more comments that flow out of uh, what, what we said about the kernels. So um, by just uh, writing this out in coefficients, what you can do is you can write down the uh, series expansion for the kernel. It's in the Hilbert space. So those these coefficients here uh, will be square summable. Um, I have chosen, well, last time I, I took sort of adjoints here because I wanted to arrive at that sort of CPNC formulation. Here I want to do something different. I'll just take complex conjugates of the whole thing. So this W bar, again, is not an adjoint, right? It's just the entry-wise complex conjugate without the transpose. Um, and the same thing with the bars on the vectors. I mean, I just conjugate the, the entries. Uh, and so if I write it that way, um, what you can do is if you think about this, I, I can write this as uh, in the inside, Kronecker tensor product of Ws with Zs. And on the outside, I have these vectors tensored and this identity n is just the identity map from the n by n matrices to itself. And uh, what we have inside here is just really sort of an NC geometric series. Uh, the same computation I did for the drury Iverson kernel shows that this is really just one minus W bar Z inverse. And I'm, I'm using this sort of abbreviated notation. So uh, my one minus W bar Z is really uh, um, it's, it's two copies of the identity. Yeah, I'm running out of room here, sorry. Um, this W bar Z notation uh, to save too many symbols is really just a sum WJ bar tensor, Kronecker tensor product uh, ZJ. Um, so that's what that notation means. Uh, and so what you have here is something in the middle that looks very, very much like you know, sort of the Zago kernel we're familiar with. This is now some uh, matrix valued thing. And then I, I uh, sort of trace out or, or, or an inner product out in, in the W variable, but leave the Z variable alone. So when I'm all done, I get a function of Z. And so this, this last expression that's highlighted in the blue here um, is a prototype for, for uh, what I'm, what's called an, an, an NC rational function. There's, and this is, and this particular expression here, where again, the W, I'm, I'm thinking of the W is fixed. The X and the U are fixed vectors and the Z is the variable. 
Uh, and so this is a particular sort of representation of this function of Z and it's called a descriptor realization, which is comes from maybe the engineering literature. Uh, but this is uh, points to sort of a, a, a I want to say a couple of things about very, very quickly about uh, NC rational functions because uh, what happens is this is in the NC setting a rational function. So these, the, the, the point I want to make is that these uh, reproducing kernels are, are, are rational in the appropriate sense. So uh, I just want to introduce a few pieces of terminology about rational functions before I move on. So uh, these kinds of rational functions are extremely important in other aspects of non commutative function theory that I haven't talked about, especially in uh, problems connected to engineering about uh, matrix inequalities uh, and uh, convexity and uh, things like that. So the work of Halton and Clef and McCullough and, and uh, uh, some of the things that Ryan talked about yesterday. Um, so uh, we have a monic linear pencil. So again, the X's are gonna be these NC variables here. And again, this notation really, when I, when I substitute in, this is gonna be identity tensor, uh, identity minus the sum aj tensor xj. So that's how I evaluate an expression on this variable. So these products are really Kronecker tensor products. So the idea is I fix some coefficients matrices of some fixed size. And, and then I can, I can view this as a sort of NC function and NC polynomial, but with matrix coefficients rather than scalar coefficients. Um, so that's a monoclinear linear pencil. Uh, which don't worry about the terms. So what's a rational function? Well, an NC rational expression is sort of what you would imagine it would be. So if you think about ordinary rational functions, the way you make them is you start with polynomials, uh, you call those rational, uh, and then you start inverting things and anything that you can start with, a, so by starting with a polynomial and taking inverses and taking more products and sums and algebraic operations, uh, you generate this sort of uh, field of functions, which is called the, the rational functions. And so in the NC world, we'll simply do the same thing. So uh, without being sort of too careful about it, I'll just say an NC rational expression is just any syntactically correct expression built from polynomials and, and inverses. So uh, I can take like, you know, uh, X squared minus Y inverse plus Y squared and then inverse that and then so on. So uh, I can build very complicated expressions just by combining parentheses and polynomials and inverses and so on. You can build just some finite expression like that. That's called a rational expression. Um, and then the idea is this will define an NC function uh, at least you know where it makes sense. So the idea is well, it, it, the domain is simply the, the set where it's defined. So the point is, I, I just look at. Uh, in this case, uh, for this expression to be defined, I would need x squared minus y to be invertible. And then I would also need uh, this expression that appears inside the inverse, I would need that to be invertible. And so it's just uh, the collection of all the things that make all the inverses that you're required to take exist. Okay, so that's just a, a rational expression and it's got some domain. Uh, conceivably could, could be empty. I mean, if, if you uh, did things wrong. I mean, so, so, the, so the point is, I mean, zero inverse is syntactically correct rational expression, because I started with a polynomial and I threw in an inverse, uh, but of course this, this has empty domain, uh, but that's okay. So that's what an NC rational function is more or less. And, and, and so a, a thing that you, you should uh, be aware of is that, um, I mean, sort, sort of like what happens in, in well, I mean, I ramble too much, but, but I mean, you can, have, you can have different rational expressions that sort of represent the same function. So a, a simple example would be something like this. So if I look at x times one minus y x inverse, well, by a piece of algebra that I think is very familiar, this is the same thing as one minus x y inverse times x, at least uh, on some domain where this makes sense. So if x times y, x and y are both contractive or something. So these are two different, I mean, at formally as rational expressions as polynomials and inverse and so forth, these are two different expressions, uh, but they, uh, they have uh, an overlapping domain. There's at least some domain where, where that they have in common. And on that common domain, they're equal. Uh, so strictly speaking, when you want to talk about an NC rational function, uh, I won't sort of state things too precisely, but, but roughly speaking, what you have to deal with are equivalence classes of rational expressions. And so th <clears throat> these two rational expressions would belong to the same equivalence class because they, there exists a, <clears throat> and, uh, their domains have non-empty intersection and on that intersection they're uh, 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 equal. Um, so really an NC rational function, properly speaking, should be uh, an equivalence class of rational expressions, but I won't uh, worry too much about the details. Uh, the important thing, um, 
is that NC rational expressions, uh, NC rational functions, once you uh, uh, tidy up the details, uh, all have very elegant uh, sort of, well, I shouldn't say all have, but there's one important caveat, but uh, they have uh, convenient representations. And so uh, the reason I introduced linear pencils is that's what I need to describe them. So this is a theorem uh, due essentially to Schutzenberger in the 1960s, which predates any kind of non-commutative function theories. This actually comes from the world of uh, uh, automata and, and formal languages and things that seem uh, quite far removed from what we're doing. Uh, but really that there were people who were concerned with formal power series and manipulating formal power series with sort of very abstract coefficients. That's where this comes from. For our purposes, what I wanna say is if I have a, a rational expression um, and make the importance in uh, assumption that zero belongs to its domain. And again, uh, that need not be satisfied. If I try to take the inverse of a commutator, then for example, zero is not in the domain of that thing. But if I have zero in the domain, um, then it admits a descriptor realization. So I have this linear pencil in the middle. So again, if I write this out longhand, this is C star one minus uh, AX inverse B. And again, this is really a sum AJ tensor XJ like that. And then the C and the B act only in the A and I get some coefficients. So uh, the point is, if I have a rational expression which is regular at the origin, then it emits uh, what's called a descriptor realization. So descriptor realization is just, that's what this expression is called. For some monic linear pencil A and some vectors. And uh, these descriptor real, and, and in fact, the converse is true. So if I have a descriptor realization, then at least in some neighborhood of the origin, uh, this uh, coincides with some NC rational expression. Uh, and this can all be proved. This is all proved very formally just by manipulations with, with power series, uh, formal power series. Uh, but just a, bits of, a few bits of terminology. So once you have a realization, uh, sorry, a descriptor realization, they're very far from unique. Uh, the same rational expression can have many different uh, descriptor realizations. Uh, but what you can do is you, they, when, they're, when they exist, there always exists a minimal one, right? Because as soon as I have a realization for some R, uh, this pencil, these coefficients A have some size N, and I can look over all the possible realizations, uh, and there must obviously be one of minimal size, because the size is a positive integer. So uh, the good thing about these is that even though they're not unique, uh, the minimal realization uh, is going to be unique up to a similarity because uh, the A, B, and C, again, can't be uniquely determined because, again, I can conjugate the A, B, and C all by the right similarity and get a uh, new A, B, and C, which is really just a change of basis. But the point is, for a minimal realization up to a change of basis, uh, it's unique. Um, and that's an extremely useful fact. And then there's a, a, an important result of uh, Voltage, which is only much more recent. Uh, that the minimal realization is somehow the correct one because I talked about equivalence classes and overlapping domains and all that. But the point is that the minimal realization has the maximal domain of any rational expression that it represents. So the minimal realization is somehow the right one to use. Um, and maybe one more comment. Uh, polynomials themselves, of course, are rational expressions. They just don't have any inverses in them. Um, and if you think about, uh, if you're representing a polynomial, well, the point is this, this uh, near the origin, this linear pencil can be expanded in a geometric series. And so the point is I can write this as C star or some, you know, A to the alpha, X to the alpha B, or if I, I can write that as this, I can bring the coefficients inside. This looks like the computations we were doing with the kernels. Um, but notice that if I started with a polynomial, then uh, this series sort of is zeros after some point. Um, which tells you that these numbers, these coefficients, these entries of the A to the alphas will be zero. So one way for that to happen is of course that the A's are jointly nilpotent. If the A's themselves, the powers of the A's uh, for large alpha are, are all zero. And the point is if you have a minimal realization, the converse is true. So uh, if I look at a minimal realization for a polynomial like this, uh, the A's are gonna be jointly nilpotent. And so then the point is it's then obviously a polynomial. So uh, I'm not going to use this for anything going on. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, switch gears in a minute. But uh, 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 anyway, in dealing with even dealing with polynomials uh, in rational functions in this space, uh, access to these realizations and properties of the minimal realization are extremely important in, in proving things. Uh, one reason for this is that uh, if you think about how you would try to generalize proofs that you're familiar with in the one variable setting in the Hardy space, if you want to prove something about a polynomial, 
Well, uh, an easy thing to do is you just factor the polynomial and then try to prove things about the factors and so on. In the NC setting, uh, factoring polynomials is obviously much more fraught. Uh, I mean, you can sort of factor them, but factorizations aren't unique and you don't have these sort of simple linear factors anymore. Uh, and so arguments in one variable that involve factorizations of polynomials are unlikely to succeed in, in the multivariable set in this you know, NC setting. Uh, it turns out a good, a good substitute for that is to work with realizations. Uh, and, and realizations uh, are sort of the, the right tool. Um, so I'll mention that. So anyway, uh, from what I said before, the point is these NC kernels, because I just wrote them down as having descriptor realizations uh, are rational functions. Um, and in fact, we can go further. So this is a, actually a fairly recent theorem of uh, uh, Rob Martin and uh, Elias Shamovich and myself. Um, not, not so hard to prove, but um, uh, you can ask then which, which NC rational functions belong to this NC Hardy space. So in, in the, the disk setting in, in the classical H2, of course, it's easy to see which rational functions belong in the Hardy space. The answer is they, can they, they just don't have any poles in the closed disk. Uh, and you can prove that easily by doing integral estimates in the L2 norm. And in the NC setting, of course, we don't have integrals or boundary values in any uh, known useful sense. So uh, you have to come about it in a different way and the right way to approach these realizations. So uh, we can characterize the NC rational functions that are in the, uh, that have square summable series by their realizations. So the theorem says uh, what's written there. So if R is an NC rational function and I take its, uh, its uh, minimal, minimal descriptor realization. And again, the point is the minimal one is always the correct one to use. If I take its minimal descriptor realization, uh, then uh, I can say that R belongs to the Hardy space if and only if the spectral radius of that pencil, the, a, the coefficients A there, the joint spectral radius from the last lecture, if and only if the spectral radius of A is strictly less than one. And then if you combine that with uh, Popescu's Rota Strang theorem, which I also mentioned, uh, that means you can, by, move, by the similarity, move the A over to a W bar for a row contraction. And that means that since the minimal realization, I mean, again, I can move it by a similarity, it's still a minimal realization. Uh, since A will be similar to a row contraction, what that means is I can uh, re-express, I can change the basis and re-express my rational function uh, in this form, Well, W is a point in the row ball. In other words, it's a kernel. So the conclusion is, and we saw already just by an algebraic form of, of the kernels that the kernels are rational functions. And this is a converse. What this says is then that uh, the reproducing kernels for the NC Hardy space are exactly the same as the rational functions that are in the space. Um, so, so said that way, it sounds a little strange because uh, if you think about the, the Hardy space and the disk, this is of course not true. I mean, the kernels are just, you know, these one over one minus. Uh, so so in, 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 the, in the classical setting, the kernels are just you know, the Zago kernel like that, which is a rational function, but certainly not every rational function is a Zago kernel. Every rational function in the space is a linear combination of Zago kernels. But uh, the, the way to see that things are correct is to remember that, that our reproducing kernels here are reproducing kernels at all the matrix levels simultaneously. And remember in the Hardy space, we, we could use the functional calculus uh, in H2 of the disk. What we could do is uh, I could take a, a n by n matrix Z of norm one, and I can still evaluate Hardy space functions at matrix points. And I can still have these sort of uh, matrix, let me call it W, sorry. Uh, I can still evaluate at matrix points just like I did before using the functional calculus. I still get these bounded uh, evaluations of entries. And so in the classical Hardy space, I do have still these reproducing kernels for these you know, matrix points. And this theorem is then the proof goes through identically. This theorem is true in the Hardy space. So every rational heart function in the Hardy space classically, um, well, is not the reproducing kernel at, at a point in the disk, but is a reproducing kernel uh, of this sort of matrix type. Uh, and so that's how you sort of correct things. Um, it's not a deep fact in any, uh, by any means, but, it's, um, but it sort of explains what's going on here. So it's not, <clears throat> not quite as, as weird as it would seem. Okay, so I think that's all I want to say about uh, uh, rational functions. Uh, I guess I should, sorry, if I, I, um, I'll advertise uh, uh, Rob Martin's talk uh, later this afternoon. He's going to talk in more detail about uh, things you can do with rational functions in this space. You can even do uh, in this NC Hardy space, I won't talk about it, but you can do some version of the de Brange Rovniak construction, 
So there are Dobrynjovniak spaces and the Dobrynjovniak spaces for these rational functions are sort of, uh, can be analyzed successfully and uh, Rob will talk about some of that. Um, but the last uh, topic of these lectures and, and uh, an important one is uh, the issue of multipliers. Um, and so in, in several of the, the focus weeks uh, already in this focus program, uh, we've looked at various spaces. We've looked at uh, the Hardy space uh, and the Bergman space, uh, the Dirichlet space, uh, Debrange, uh, Rovniak spaces and many others. And uh, in all of these function spaces, a question, a question that people uh, are, are uh, people like us who work in function spaces ask is what are the multipliers? Uh, and of course the multiplier just means that phi f is in your space uh, whenever f is in your space. Uh, if when f's are analytic, the fees you expect to be analytic. Um, analysis with kernels tells you the fees have to be bounded. Um, sometimes they're all the bounded fees, like in the Hardy and Bergman case, sometimes they're not all the bounded fees, but okay, so, so uh, we wanna analyze and discover what the multipliers are. Um, and it turns out for this NC Hardy space, this has a, a decent answer. Um, to begin with, let's start with some very, very with the simplest possible multipliers. And let me uh, go back here. So in all of these spaces, uh, especially uh, Hardy, Bergman, and Dirichlet, a thing that, and in fact, uh, in the lectures that we saw already on these spaces, I mean, I mean a thing that uh, the simplest possible multiplier uh, is multiplication by Z. Uh, in the Hardy space, that's the shift operator. You have a Bergman shift, a Dirichlet shift. And uh, we ask lots of operator theor theoretic questions about the shift operator. So uh, a natural place to start in the NC setting will be with uh, NC versions of the shifts. Well, okay, so in our NC Hardy space, we have an orthonormal basis of monomials, just like in the classical Hardy space. Uh, and then we have, well, we don't have one shift operator anymore. Since I have D variables, I have D of them. I can choose uh, each one of the coordinate functions, each one of the, in turn, uh, and think about shifting in that coordinate. And I also have a choice to make, because again, I'm non-commutative, whether I want to shift on the left or on the right. And I'll talk mostly about the left and then you can sort of believe that everything I say has a kind of mirror image statement for right shifts. Um, and and when, once you figure out what happens on the left, it sort of uh, kind of transparently uh, has a right version. So let's talk about the left. So I have these left shifts. So I'll write this L sub J for the left shift by ZJ. So I just take my power series, I multiply by ZJ. So the monomial Z alpha gets shifted to the monomial ZJ alpha, so the word uh, alpha, I append a J uh, at the beginning of the word, and these are sometimes called left creation operators if you work in sort of the Fox space language, which I won't bother with. But what you see from this power series is exactly what you see from you know, the usual case of the shift in the Hardy space is that uh, each LJ is an isometry, uh, simply because I have the same coefficient C alpha. Uh, it's just that uh, in this case, I don't have all the monomials appearing anymore. I only have the monomials that appear uh, so the range uh, of uh, LJ oops, is just uh, the span of those monomials that start with J. So what that means is if I took LI instead, well, then I would get the span of the monomials monomial zi alpha, and if i and j are different, these two sets of monomials are all mutually orthogonal because they're all orthogonal to each other. So what that tells you is these are isometries, but it's a system of isometries that has orthogonal ranges. Uh, and I can, I can package this condition of isometries with orthogonal ranges into a single identity like that. Li star lj is the chronic or delta, I should say chronic or delta, I guess, times the identity operator in h. Uh, but it's a, it's a, a, a a uh, system of isometries with orthogonal ranges. And the other thing that this tells you is if I arrange the L's into a row, and then I put the L stars in a column like that, then uh, this is the D by D you know, uh, identity operator. So what that tells you is that if, that if I arrange the L's into a row, that single row is an isometry. So we call L a row isometry. So now uh, you can take single isometries and you think about what happens for a single isometry. You have you know, a wool decomposition, there's shifts and unitaries and so on and so forth. You can start asking all the same questions for row isometries. And so uh, uh, Jelu talked about some of that in his talk and uh, uh, many of the big uh, 
initial theorems about uh, real isometries are due to him. So I'll call this the left D shift, uh, this D variable shift of orthogonal ranges. Um, and then I'll call uh, an NC function a left multiplier if simply uh, we have this condition that uh, looks like exactly the definition of a multiplier in the usual case. If I just multiply by F uh, by phi on the left, uh, it stays in the space. Uh, analogously, of course, there's a definition of a, of a right multiplier. So uh, the natural question is, uh, what are the left multipliers? Which function, which NC functions give us left multipliers? Um, of course, uh, from what I just said, each of the ZJs is a left multiplier. Uh, and therefore, polynomials in the Zs are left multipliers because they just get a polynomial and a bounded operator. Um, and then, you know, by the definition, what you get are sort of weak limits of polynomials. If I take limits of these things, if I think of these operators, uh, if, if, well, I have to sort of think about how you want to take limits, but what you believe is some kind of weak limits of polynomials should still be multipliers, whatever that means. Um, but you get a good answer. And, and the good answer is the following. So, uh, phi is a left multiplier of the NC Hardy space. If, and only if, well, it's the best answer you could hope for. Phi is bounded. Well, bounded in which domain? Now we do have to be careful about the domain. Cause I said these NC power, these L2 power series, uh, Converge while well, they converge in the row ball, but also in the column ball, and more generally in the spectral radius ball. And the reason to favor the row ball finally is given by this theorem because the point is that the norm of the multiplier, the multiplier is bounded if and only if it's bounded in the row ball specifically. So not in the spectral radius ball or the column ball, but the row ball. So left multipliers are the things that are bounded in the row ball. And even better, just like in the Hardy space, the norm of the multiplier is exactly the soup norm over the row ball, the H infinity norm, in other words. Yeah, um, and so uh, in, in Popescu's original formulation, um, so, so here again, it wasn't literally in the space of and this sort of NC function formalism, uh, because the thing that happens, uh, which I haven't mentioned, but um, we have these evaluations, but uh, I've been talking about them uh, where the disease are matrices. Uh, but in fact, this also works for uh, things at the infinite level. So I can take tuples of operators that have row norm of less than one. They still have this functional calculus. And so what Popescu proved was, was that, in fact, uh, this, this, this is the soup, uh, not over just matrices, but over all operators. Um, and with a tiny bit of extra work using Popescu's dilation theorem, you can show that, in fact, it's enough to take the soup just over matrices, or just over the finite levels. So the multipliers are, are what you hope they would be. They're bounded functions on the correct domain and the correct domain uh, is row ball. If I work on the left. Um, and moreover, uh, these abstract row isometries, these shift operators, um, these were studied for a long time uh, by Popescu and by Davidson and Pitts and others. Uh, this object called the free semigroup algebra. So you take uh, these L's, uh, you take polynomials in them and then you take uh, weak operator limits of those things. And that gives you some kind of abstract analog of the, the weak operator algebra generated by the weak operator closed, sorry, the weakly closed algebra generated by the shift, which we know to be sort of completely isometrically isomorphic to H infinity by the functional calculus. And the point is the same thing happens here. So you have a completely isometric isomorphism between these operator algebras, the abstract operator algebra generated by these, uh, the D shift and the sort of more concrete thing of these left multipliers. And so that, that all works the way it does in, in, in the disk. Um, so we sort of know what the multipliers are. Um, I stated this here for the left and maybe as a quick warning, um, you can ask, well, there should be an analogous thing on the right, but uh, if, if you stare at it for a minute, the left and right multipliers are not the same set of functions. So you need a different theorem here uh, on, on the right. And, and the point is that the row ball is not the right domain. And maybe I'll uh, leave it as a puzzle for you if you're interested to figure out what the right domain is. But uh, the left and right multipliers are not the same. And maybe, um, well, in the interest of time, I may not want to go through in this example in too much detail, but here's the idea. If I look at, uh, say, in two variables, if I look at these monomials, Z1 to the N, Z2, corresponding to L1 to the N, L2, these have orthogonal ranges uh, as I let N range over the integers. Uh, you can see that just by looking at the words. So what that's going to mean is that if I take uh, a square summable sequence of coefficients, say of, of uh, norm one, if I look at this operator, this sum C1 L1 to the N L2, this is also an isometry. 
precisely because these things have orthogonal ranges. Uh, and therefore, th this that means this function, if I let f of uh, z1, z2 be this sum cn z1 to the n z2, this is a left multiplier. It's an isometry. And the point is, uh, if I like, I can think of this as h of z1 times z2. Now, my cn's are just any square summable sequence of norm one. So this h is really any uh, function in the usual Hardy space. So if I take any function in the usual Hardy space of z1 and multiply by z2, that's a bounded left multiplier. But uh, if I look at the same function, h of z1, z2, and think of it as, as acting on the right, then what will happen is it, this will be bounded as a right multiplier if and only if this function in one variable is actually bounded as h infinity. So uh, if you then take any h2 function that's not bounded, I get an example by this construction of a left multiplier that's not a right multiplier. Uh, there is a simple relationship between them, but um, I'll, in the interest of time, I want to move on. But you, you, you can sort of uh, straighten this out and figure out what's going on. Uh, basically, what you have to do is just reverse the order of all the words. It's a sort of transpose map that sends alpha to writing it in the opposite order. That transpose map on the monomials induces a unitary of the Hilbert space. And then uh, basically what you get is the right multipliers or the images of the left multipliers under this uh, sort of word reversal map. And then you can patch everything up that way. Uh, OK, but I, I'd like to, to move on. So an, uh, an important thing that I mentioned uh, at the end of last time was, again, the connection with the drury arvison space. And that was if I took an F uh, in the NC Hardy space and restricted it to level one, Uh, I got something in the drury arvison space. And moreover, this, this map uh, plays well with norms. Uh, the norm is a, is a, this restriction map is a partial isometry. Uh, and, more, and conversely, uh, every uh, F in the drury arvison space has a, has a Hilbert space norm preserving sort of free lift. I can extend it to the balls at higher levels. Uh, while preserving the Hilbert space norm. And then the next theorem is a result, which is, uh, uh, again, I'm stating in this NC language, in this NC function theory language, which wasn't how it was originally formulated. It was originally formulated in terms of just this uh, free semigroup algebra. Uh, but the point is the same thing happens for the multipliers. If I take uh, uh, multipliers, so that's what this theorem of um, this Davidson and Pitts theorem says, if I take a multiplier of the NC Hardy space, which I'll write maybe is, uh, NCH infinity, a left multiplier, and restrict it to level one. That's a multiplier of the drury arvison space. That restriction map is a complete, as a complete contraction on, on operator algebras, and it's even a complete quotient map. So even more importantly, uh, the converse happens. So again, I can lift. And this is much less obvious why this would be true. Um, and I'll even say the obvious choice of lifting doesn't work. Uh, but what happens is if I take a contractive multiplier of the drury arvison space, uh, there exists an NC function up in the row ball uh, whose sup norm is the same as the norm of the Hardy's of the drury arvison multiplier. Uh, so that I have a lift. So I have a norm preserving free lift. So I can do this, so the same thing, this, this thing that I said in the Hilbert space norm, uh, this lifting business also works in the multiplier norm. Uh, though that it, that it works in the multiplier norm is uh, much less obvious. Uh, and I'm not going to prove this. Uh, the proof of this converse, uh, you can do it in a couple of different ways, probably, but the right way to do it is via realizations. So not the descriptor realizations of rational functions that I talked about before, but a related thing called an ABCD realization, which I'll write down for the people who have seen it before. Uh, so something that looks like a real descriptor realization, although uh, the A's don't have to be matrices anymore. They can be operators in some Hilbert space. Uh, but basically by showing that your multipliers in, in both the commutative and non-commutative settings have realizations, you can prove this lifting theorem. Um, but this, this now gives you a, a, a sort of viable method for maybe passing back and forth between theorems about uh, this, these NC multipliers, these bounded functions in the row ball and uh, the drury arvison space. And I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. So. Uh, to get there, uh, the next big thing I want to talk about is a, a Burling theorem, because we have these shift operators now. And the most famous theorem about the shift operator is the Burling theorem, which tells you what its invariant subspaces are. 
So we can do the same thing. We can ask for invariant subspaces of the, the ZJs. Well, really, we want to ask them about joint invariant subspaces, invariant subspaces for all the left shifts simultaneously, uh, which quickly reduces to just saying it's the same thing as the invariant subspaces for all the multipliers simultaneously. So we'll say, uh, just like we talk about invariant subspaces in the Hardy space or the Bergman space or Dirichlet space or wherever, uh, to say a closed subspace is left invariant um, if it's invariant under all left multipliers. So uh, phi f uh, is in the space whenever f is in the space. Uh, that's a left invariant subspace. Of course, I could also talk about uh, right invariant subspaces, and I'll get sort of mirror image theorems about those. Uh, similarly, we, we can make a definition just like as we do in the uh, commutative setting. We talk about a cyclic vector. So a cyclic vector is one where well, if I take the vector, uh, taking any individual function, I can look at, say, the left invariant subspace it generates. So I can take all left multipliers on f and then close that up and I get a space. The invariant subspace generated by f. You say f is cyclic if that invariant subspace is the whole space. In other words, multipliers times f are dense in f. Or in other words, uh, maybe I didn't use this notation else, elsewhere, but the cyclic invariant subspace generated by f is the whole space. So um, uh, I'll state a simple version of the NC Burling theorem. Uh, this isn't the full version because here I'm making the extra hypothesis that M is cyclic. Uh, there's still a version for general uh, subspaces. I don't need to require them to be cyclic. Uh, I should mention that in, in, of course, in the classical theorem in, in, in the Hardy space in H2, uh, every invariant subspace is cyclic. Uh, that's not the case anymore in the NC setting. But I'll say uh, in, in, in the cyclic case, what happens? Um, this is a theorem discovered independent. Well, again, not just the cyclic case, the general theorem was discovered independently by Popescu, or Arias and Popescu, and then later by Davidson and Pitts. Um, but in the cyclic case, what it says, if I have a cyclic, uh, okay, now I have to be careful about left and right. Here's what I'm gonna do. I, I stated here about, uh, this is sort of left cyclic, but I could talk about right cyclic as well. Uh, let me state the theorem in the right case. So, so right invariant. So here I'm looking at the right invariant subspace. So F times right multipliers. Uh, the idea is that one way to say Burling's theorem is that the invariant subspace is the range of an isometry. And that's what happens here. And the point is, if you keep track of left and right, a right invariant subspace will be in, in the range of a left isometric multiplier. Uh, and it's sort of clear how that should work because if I look at theta times F, then uh, everything, if I want to generate an invariant subspace, well, if I multiply this thing on the right, then that's still in the range of theta. So if I multiply, so the range of a left multiplication operator will be right invariant. And so that's why I have to be careful about left and right. Similarly, if I want a left invariant subspace, it's going to be the range of a right invariant multiplier. Um, but just like in Burling's theorem, it's an isometric multiplier. So ranges, so, so invariant subspaces are ranges of isometries. In the cyclic case, it's just the range of a single isometry. In the non-cyclic case, I would have a row isometry. Uh, and then my invariant subspace would look like a row times a column. And the whole row together would be a row isometry. Um, but that's the Burling theorem in the cyclic case. I won't prove this, but actually, I mean, if you think about the operator theoretic proof of Burling's theorem, what do you do? You take your you take your shift. You should restrict the shift operator to the invariant subspace, and then apply the Wold decomposition. Uh, and it's basically the same th thing here. So, but there's a Popescu's version of the Wold decomposition for the row isometries lets you prove this. So I won't say about the proof, but it 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 runs by familiar steps. Okay. Well, you get an immediate corollary of this, which is an inner outer factorization, because all I do is I apply the Burling theorem to the right invariant subspace generated by uh, f. So a right multiplier, close that up. If I apply the Burling theorem to the right invariant subspace generated by F, it says that space is equal to some theta times H2NC. But of course, F itself is in this space. So F looks like theta times something. And then by the usual business, you get that this uh, F is a cyclic, the capital F is a cyclic vector. So just like in, in the, the classical setting, F factors as an isometry, an isometric multiplier times a cyclic vector. And so you can think of the isometric multiplier as an NC inner function and the cyclic vector as an NC outer function. Although 
right now, this is totally abstract and operator theoretic, and there's no function theory uh, here yet. Um, but this is, I mean, has a strong claim on being called some kind of inner outer factorization. So if you've done this now, you can sort of ask several questions. I mean, certainly the obvious questions are gonna be, is there any sort of function theoretic content to these inner outer factors? And um, I'll get to that in a second. But before I get to that, let's notice that combining everything I've just said, uh, you get a factorization theorem in the, uh, in the purely commutative realm for the drury arvison space. Because uh, it then says the following. It says, if I take a theorem, uh, a function in the drury arvison space, I can factor it as some theta times F where theta is a contractive multiplier. Now, it's contractive in general, it won't be inner in the sense that it won't be an isometric multiplier. It turns out in the drury arvison space, you don't have any isometric multipliers except for the, the constants um, in, in several variables. But nonetheless, you can write it as a contractive multiplier times a cyclic vector, so some kind of outer function. And moreover, the norm of the cyclic vector is the same as the norm of the original F. And the proof consists of just combining everything I just said. So the point is you take F in your drury arvison space, you lift it to uh, a function in the NC Hardy space. You uh, factor that function by the Burling theorem as some theta of Z times some say F wiggle of Z. That's the NC Burling theorem. And then when you restrict back down to the ball at level one, I get some uh, multiplier here, which is since this was an isometry, it's contractive and the restriction map will give me another contractive thing. And I'll get some uh, F tilde there. Uh, and you can just check that if I restrict the cyclic vector, I get a cyclic vector and then that's the factorization. Uh, and this works also not just for the Hardy space, but for also complete pick spaces, which uh, that connection I'll uh, refer to Michael Hartz's lectures next week. Uh, but this is a simple example of a way that you can prove something about these, this commutative setting, about commutative function spaces via this free lift business. And the point is, uh, the free lifts respect both the Hilbert space norm and the multiplier norm. That's why this hangs together. Uh, you can do more things. You can talk about nevin linna pick interpolation and stuff like that, but I think I'll, I'll suppress that and, and move on. Um, you can also do this, uh, I'll mention not for a single F, but if I have a column full of Fs, you can again write uh, this as a sort of column multiplier times a, a cyclic F, and you can uh, apply that to factorization and uh, for other further factorization theorem and so forth. But anyway, the, the point is, uh, this, this is a way that you can uh, prove things in the commutative setting by, uh, and then this happens across the theory, even in sort of parts of the engineering literature that I mentioned about, you know, realizations for rational functions. You can prove things about ordinary functions of commuting variables by proving things in the NC realm and then restricting to the ball at level one. So this happens uh, in, in many places across the subject. Um, and, and, and I think it's part of the reason that, that it's interesting, not just the NC stuff is interesting in its own right, but it can tell you sort of things about the, the commutative world. Okay, so let me, uh, in the, the seven minutes I have left, uh, revisit this uh, NC inner outer factorization and ask if we can interpret it or, or get any sort of more general uh, function theoretic information rather than just abstract uh, operator information. And what kind of information would we, would, would we want? Well, uh, obviously in the H2 case, if I write uh, F as its uh, inner outer factorization classically, a thing that we know is that, uh, for example, the zero information about F is all contained in the inner factor. Uh, the zero information is contained in the inner factor. And so this leads us to ask questions about, uh, say, zero sets of, uh, of NC functions. Um, and so let me tell you something there. Actually, before I do that, um, well, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you can ask, so, so you can ask sort of, sort of what, what are the inner functions? I mean, how do they look like? And so the, in, in, in the cyclic case, sorry, in, in the H2 case, we know that these are generally inner functions in the sense that the uh, boundary values are equal to one uh, almost everywhere on the circle. Uh, and then you can ask what do the outer functions look like? And of course you have this Reese representation of the outer function as a Herglotz integral, et cetera. And then, you know, the inner functions factor into Blaschke products and, and, and singular 
uh, and, and, and you get detailed information about the function theoretic behavior of f from this. Um, so you can ask, so can you characterize the outer functions? Um, I'll say uh, ahead of time, right now in the NC case, we really have no good intrinsic description of function theoretically what the inner functions really look like and what the outer functions really look like. This is nearly a wide open problem. Uh, we can say a little bit if we if we specialize to say polynomials are rational functions. Um, and so this is a, another result of Robinelli and I. So if I stick to NC rational functions or polynomials, uh, then you can say a few elementary things that you hope would be true. The first is that if I look at the NC inner outer factorization of a rational function or polynomial, then both the inner and the outer factors are themselves rational. Uh, and in fact, if, if, my, uh, if I start with a polynomial, the outer factor is also polynomial. You can prove that using older things. You can prove that using Popescu's version of Fehere's theorem. But anyway, if I have a polynomial and I factor it, the outer factor is a polynomial and uh, the degree doesn't go up just like it would in, in just like what happens in the classical case. And also in the polynomial and the rational case, we can in fact characterize what the NC outer functions look like. Uh, if you think about the Hardy space, um, it's easy to characterize the, the, the polynomials that are outer for the Hardy space. They're outer if and only if they have no zeros in the disk. And the answer turns out to be the same here. So uh, if I have a, an, a polynomial or a rational function, uh, again, just polynomials and rational functions. For polynomials and rational functions, these things will be cyclic if and only if they have no zeros in the row ball. And no zeros means that the matrix F of Z is non-singular. The determinant is not zero anywhere in the row ball. So that's a satisfying theorem. Um, and not overly difficult to prove maybe, but then you think about how you prove this in the, in, in the Hardy space. And in the Hardy space, this is easy to prove because I just factor the polynomial. And if I want to prove it's cyclic, it suffices to prove just this each individual factor is cyclic. And for a single linear factor, you could just barehandedly prove that it's cyclic. I mean, you can just write down a, an approximating sequence and you're done. As I mentioned before, a polynomial in the NC setting, I mean, you can't factor it to linear factors like this. And, and uh, I mean, you can sort of factor it, but not in a helpful way, probably. So it's, it's I mean, it, it's a reasonable conjecture and you believe it and it ends up being true, but um, proving it is somehow you have to really in, invoke some completely different set of ideas. Uh, and not surprisingly, the, the completely different set of ideas you, you need uh, are realizations. Uh, realizations, but one extra ingredient. Um, because e e even <clears throat> if you think about what this says, that that uh, if you think about how the, how in, in the Hardy space the inner outer Blaschke singular outer factorization works, saying that this con this condition is sufficient uh, is really saying that a polynomial can't have a singular inner factor. So somehow in the NC case, if you're proving that, you're proving polynomials can't have singular inner factors, whatever that means. So uh, to tidy that up, let me in the last couple of minutes say a, a word about zero sets. So what should a zero set be in the NC setting? Uh, and it turns out, well, you can, you can investigate different notions, but the right one, at least for our purposes, turns out to be this. So I'm going to look at not just places where F of Z is a singular matrix, but I want to keep track of a direction if it's, in which it's non-singular. So I'm going to look at a vector Y that's orthogonal to the range of F of Z. So a pair of ZY is a detailed zero of F. Of course, I want Y to be a non-zero vector here. A detailed zero if uh, Y is orthogonal to the range of F. This is set up for right invariant subspaces. Of course, there's also a left invariant version where you just look at the other side. And so the left detailed zero set will simply be all the pairs, again, y here, of where Y is or non-zero vectors of these uh, zeros. So this is the analog of a zero set of an NC rational function. Um, it's easy to check that uh, if I look at the zeros of f, if I have a detailed zero of f, then it's also a detailed zero of f times phi for any phi on the right, uh, which means that uh, if f is cyclic, then it can't have any detailed zeros, right? Because any detailed zero of f will be inherited by the invariant subspace, just like classically. And also it tells you that if I have an inner outer factorization, then the inner factor uh, carries all of the zero information of f. Uh, it's, you quickly see from this formula that f has a detailed zero at, at zy if and only if the, the inner factor does. So this is sort of satisfying. The inner factor has all the zero information. Um, but still, I mean, it's not like we have a Blaschke product that we know how to extract it. So it's still really a wide open question of how you extract the zero information in a useful way. 
but we can say uh, one thing uh, that's sort of, uh, I think, kind of surprising. That in the NC case, you nonetheless have a Blaschke singular outer factorization where, where um, I have to be uh, a little bit careful about how to define these. And so I'm, I'm not, it's, it's a matter of time, I'm not gonna try to do this too, but basically this F is gonna be an outer thing. This S will be a singular inner thing in the sense that um, it's an isometric multiplier. That's why I call it inner, but uh, S has no zeros in, uh, uh, S has no zeros. Uh, well, I shouldn't say determinant. The thing that's, that's I have to be careful of here is it's not strictly an NC. I, I need to look at the infinite level. Uh, I need to worry about uh, uh, zeros, at possibly uh, operator points in the functional calculus. And so I'm not going to give you a careful definition of what the Blaschke thing is, but basically what it is, is it's, it's an inner function that uh, determines its own zero set. So that the invariant subspace generated by B uh, is exactly uh, B times H2NC. So th th there's no sort of singular. Anyway, you can make sense of it. Um, and so using this fact, and uh, you can prove that uh, polynomials can't have singular inner factors. And that's how you uh, land on that. So I'm, I'm out of time. Um, so I haven't stated this theorem quite precisely because I have to give you a careful definition, but this, this works. But I'll say in terms of open problems, it's still completely wide open to give any kind of intrinsic function theoretic characterization of what any of these factors are. I think it'll be very interesting to do this. Um, and so uh, anyway, I'm out of time. So uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Let's thank Mike first. Uh, any question or remark for Mike? Oh, yeah, Mike, uh, it's Stefan here. Hi, Stefan. I have a question. This last theorem, can one just get a version where the S and the B are switched? Is that is the reason why the B is on the left? Uh, it's, it's somehow, the, the way this is set up, the, the, the B is, um, yeah, could you get a version where the S and the B are, are switched? Um, I mean, the, the way that we prove it, it kind of forces the, the B to be on the left, but uh, I don't see a reason why there couldn't be a switched version, but uh, you would have to sort of prove it differently. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, the, 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 the way the proof runs, it, it sort of, uh, it forces it to be on the left, but uh, it's not clear to me that that, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. Thanks. Further question or comments? Actually, let, let me just say, I, I mean, in, in reference to, to Stefan's question, I mean, the, the way this is set up, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you, you, you proved, I mean, you, you look at this by looking at the, of course, the right invariant uh, subspace generated by F. So so what you do need to have is that, 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 that the, uh, it's certainly what, what you're going to have this with the inner factor on the left and the outer factor on the right. There's a companion version. I mean, you could reverse everything where you, where you do the left invariant subspace instead, and you look at right zeros. But in, in, in that case, I mean, if you reversed everything, you'd have a sort of an FSV like that. Uh, but still, you'd have the, the Blaschke all the way on the outside and, and the singular sandwiched in the middle. So whether, whether you could uh, uh, have this theorem with those two reversed, yeah, I, I don't know. Is there any other a comment or question for Mike? If not, let's thank him again for this wonderful series of lectures. <laughs>